Hello, and as you might imagine, E3 has had some incredible impact on Final Fantasy XIV. We got the Monster Hunter collab announcement and a really good E3 presentation in the live letter. But as a result of that, lots of new interviews opened up, and one of which was with Gamer Escape. Now, there's going to be a couple of videos on interviews over the next few days because obviously there's a lot that are taking place whilst Yoshida is in America. People are taking advantage of that and getting some questions in and quite rightly so. This one then is with Gamer Escape and obviously all credit goes to them and a link can be found in the description to this article for you to read along. You're probably going to want to get comfortable on your way to work or wherever you're watching or listening to this because this is going to be a long one. Gamer Escape asks, at the end of patch 4.3 we saw the introduction of the role playing status with Alphano. We loved it. Do you plan to use this more in the future? Yoshida replies, we can't promise if it will come back often, but it is something that was new for us too. It was very experimental. Seeing the reaction of the players though, and how excited they were for it was great. I'm glad people were able to experience the character's story in that format. We'd like to utilize it when it's needed. Would you consider any game modes where you can play as famous NPCs in a duty or an instance? Yoshida replies, We don't want to delve into too much detail because we want to leave that element of surprise for our players. You may have noticed with Alphano, we didn't release much information at all because we wanted players to be very surprised by it. We are currently working on something that will yet again bring that element of surprise, so we're hoping that once it's implemented, players will find out and experience it firsthand. It's definitely something to look forward to. When Eureka was first introduced, it was interesting to watch the meta evolve over the first few days with how players were tackling the content. How was it for you and the development team watching players do the content? Were they tackling it in the way you intended? Yoshida says, I think for the most part the players' movements were in the range of the expectations of the development team. There were some people that waited at the base for NMs to spawn, which was something we imagined happening. Originally Originally we thought about giving a debuff to people that stayed there for too long, but we thought that might be a little too cruel. We are monitoring the players and seeing how they react to the environment that they're in. We thought about different scenarios that may or may not happen, and with the upcoming Pagos content we've observed player behaviour and tried to implement elements that takes that into consideration as we develop and create the mechanics associated with that. We look forward to seeing players strategizing or coming up with their own rules on how they're going to be observing monster spawns and the conditions to spawn them. There are a lot of references to Final Fantasy XI with NMs, minions and equipment. How did you decide to have all of these Final Fantasy XI references? With the concept for Eureka we wanted to have an environment where you didn't have any sort of limitations with time. So the more you put into the content, we say time to win, but we wanted players to take their time in the content, but still keeps the essence that's very Final Fantasy XIV like. With the references with XI, it also kind of of contributes to the fact that a lot of Final Fantasy XIV players have a love for XI. The dev team felt that some of the rule sets or the way Final Fantasy XIV is played may not apply well to the content we had planned for Eureka, with time to win or putting in as much time to approach this content. Taking inspiration from XI, where you have that kind of limitless environment felt like a good fit, so that was one element of it. Also, a lot of the staff that worked on Eureka were actually former members of the Final Fantasy XI team that transferred to 14, so they wanted to sort of inject some 11 into that content. Gamerscape adds, It was great with that patch, we had Bayako as well and the Ryzen Temple that played a track from 11 when you go and see Genbu. It was a very nostalgic patch for 11 players. Soken replies, Yes, definitely. The development team agrees that it was content that would bring a smile to 11 players and that it was a great time to capitalise on that. I definitely wanted to choose Iroa to be utilised in that instance. G's next question. Soken, we talked at PAX a few years ago, and you were torn if you wanted to do rock concerts or orchestra concerts. Now you're doing both at the same time. How has it been touring with the Primals? Soken replies, we're still in the middle of the Primals tour, so I can't speak on the entire experience, but this only could have been done because it's Final Fantasy XIV. With fourteen and the intensity of the battles and the repetitive nature of a song being looped, as well as with the different phases we have in each encounter that matches the music as well, 
it's always such a unique experience for players that do that content. It makes it so that it ties in very strongly with an emotional experience, so no matter if it's a rock concert or an orchestra concert, it makes it even more exciting, because it's not just a musical experience, because players tie in their emotional in-game experiences as well. We have players really relating to the music that's being played. Of course, with anything we do related to 14, we'll give it our all every time. With both types of concerts, they're very serious business. We've put in a lot of effort, and it was hard to get here. The preparations and practice to get here were quite a struggle. I'm really excited because we're having the orchestra concert in the Dolby Theatre this time, so we really want to make this a success. G's next question. We feel a bit bad asking this, especially since the Primals album just came out, and the Stormblood OST is out early next month, but on the Primals tour you performed the themes for Sophia and Lakshmi. When can we expect to be able to listen to those songs on an album? Sokan replies, but before we release it for sale, we should perform it during FanFest, don't you think? Of course, replies Gamer Escape. Sokan says, it's true though, and we've had many new primals added up to patch 4.3, so we'll need to consider doing some during the fan festivals, and I'm sure there are more coming. Next question, for fan fest this time around, the streams will be three. Why did you decide to do this? Yoshida replies on this one. There was a lot of thought put into this. At first we were thinking of to sell streaming tickets more smoothly in a more streamlined fashion, whilst also delivering the in-game items associated with it, while also providing a high quality stream and archive footage. While trying to find the best partner to work with for the live streams, we approached different teams like Twitch. When we talked about paid live streams though, they have a company policy where they don't typically handle personal information, and we realised that there was a hurdle we had to overcome. So why complicate the situation? We want as many people to watch the stream as possible, so why not just make it free and available to everyone? That was the quickest route, and that's probably the biggest point that was brought up in terms of making that decision. With that being said, for the in-game items associated with the FanFest event, we decided to attach that to an attendee ticket for those that will be there in person. But that may exclude people that wanted to purchase a ticket, so we also wanted to make it available as an item on the Mog Station. With Sokan being here and handling the music, I'm sure we'll plan for some music stage events as well, and with that we want to make it so it's special to the attendees that come to the event, and make it a special treat for those that were able to come enjoy it with us. Although the stream is free, we'll be excluding music stage events from that, so it's more special for those that were able to make it out and watch it live in person. Gamerscape followed up with, do you have any plans to make prior FanFest footage available? How long did the archive last? Was it one year? We didn't actually give any thought about making it available. Is that something that fans would like? Gamerscape follows, we've had a few people mention it, a member of our staff has really been wanting to re-watch things like lore panels and the other main stage events. Yoshida replies, ah, so lore panel, battle sessions, things like that with the keynote. I don't want people to watch me be nervous on stage, so maybe we'll remove the keynote, but maybe we can look into the possibility of getting the panel sessions. It might be a good idea to have it sort of condensed and make it available. You don't seem that nervous on stage, says Gamer Escape. Yoshida replies, yes, I am nervous. So many people watching me. Yes, we will archive it. The next question, Soken, with Return to Iblis, you've done a lot of arrangements on classic Final Fantasy tracks, but with the new raid it uses all of the original tracks. What's the reason for that? Soken replies, it's always a tough choice deciding if we arrange a track or not. With a return to Ivalis content, when the original composer Hitoshi Sakimoto made those songs, the quality of the sound he produced, even at the time, was very high in quality. I felt that we could take the music as is and it wouldn't feel too foreign, and that was the thinking behind it. Trying to add that sort of crazy flavour to the original source material, I don't think it would do it justice. I think that was another reason why. Even from a music perspective, his work is so great that I would want to keep the integrity of it. Yoshida then interjects, it's just too perfect. Sakamoto's tracks are so perfect that no matter how he arranges it, it will degrade the song. Sokan replies, of course, there were some tweaks made in the sound mix so that it meshes into the game, but it's pretty much the original source material as is. Yoshida caps that question off with, of course, myself and the team realised that there are players curious to know how Sokan would arrange them and give them his own flavours, but Sokan as the sound director made the decision that the songs were already of high quality and will use them as they are, and the team agrees that it was for the best. Using the original music gives it quite a nostalgic feel as well. 
We've had a lot of nostalgia in Stormblood so far with Ivalice, Final Fantasy XI in Eureka, and the fights for Omega. What has the fan reaction been that you've seen for all of this fan service in Stormblood? So can Texas question. With these different iterations where we're utilising different Final Fantasy tracks, I have a stance where whenever I'm making an arrangement of a track, I want to be accurate to the source material. I'm very relieved that the reactions we've had so far, because people seem to be very positive. Whenever there's an arrangement of a certain song, people can easily go into two different extremes with their opinions. It seems that a lot of people have accepted them though, so I'm very relieved. Yoshida replies, There are different thoughts and feelings towards a reaction, but there are people that have played the previous Final Fantasy games and they recognise the Kefka theme and get excited. Same with the music for Final Fantasy V. For those who haven't played those titles, they'll see other players get excited by recognising the themes, and it might pique their interest to make them go back and try it out. So I think it has affected the franchise as a whole, getting players excited about previous titles. In terms of Omega, we haven't completed it yet. There's still more to come in the future. We can't say much at this point, but we're glad to hear people are enjoying it, and hope they'll continue to enjoy it. Sokin finishes with, I think this may not apply to just soundbook graphics as well. If we're asked what's more difficult, creating something brand new versus arranging or interpreting something that already exists, it's harder to take existing material and make arrangements to it. Gamerscape's next question, Yesterday you announced the Monster Hunter collaboration. We were curious why you decided to put it behind Stormblood instead of making it something that players could do at, say, level 30 in the original areas. The weapon that shows up from the Capcom side is the Raphalos, is not something that you can beat at low level. It's a monster that requires you to put in your best efforts, and it's a very formidable opponent, so we wanted to recreate that challenge in Final Fantasy XIV as well. Who we call the Warrior of Light in the Monster Hunter world would be the Hunters. I feel like those high-skilled Hunters are the cream of a crop of gamers, so I feel that getting to level 70 and completing Stormblood won't be hard for those players to do. The same goes for the Behemoth that will appear in Monster Hunter. It's not an easy opponent. With the Monster Hunter collaboration, we're wondering whatever happened to the Final Fantasy XV collaboration. Yoshida replied, We're not able to say when, but for the time being, this summer our focus is for players to enjoy the Monster Hunter collaboration. Your patience is appreciated which is interesting because that doesn't rule it out. Make a note of that. We have the concerts in LA and Germany coming up. Are there more being planned as part of this sort of circuit, or will Germany be the last ones for now? For the time being, we'll consider Germany as our last stop at this time. This is us kind of testing the field to see if this overseas tour would be successful. Then we'll see if we're able to do another series of concerts. If it's not successful, then we probably won't have another concert. Are you planning on any more updates to the Glamour dresser system? Will we get more Glamour plates? Will we get the dresser as a furnishing? There are some elements that are being worked on, especially those that have very large demand. For the elements that cause server stress, we have to monitor them, and we haven't been able to act upon those just yet. We won't be increasing the number as of patch 4.4, because it relates to the stress we apply onto the servers. What has the least impact or effect on all of this is going to be where you can use the Glamour dresses, and adding more locations where you can use them. We haven't finalised everything as to addressing this with patch 4.4 and we'll have to double check once I get back to Japan, but the first update will be that you'll be able to use the glamour dressers in more areas than before. I'm very curious why we haven't seen the glamour dresser as a furnishing item yet. In terms of having a furnishing item, there's a scary amount of item data connected to it. Something like a glamour dresser has a few hundred items associated with it. With furnishing items you can move it around or someone else can move it around. It's very dangerous and risky and very unstable to have an item like that for you to place in your own personal housing. I'm sure with the convenience of moving around normal furnishings, or having retainers available, or having the ability to access market boards, it's logical to think, why can't we have it as an item? But the engineering behind that, having the items taken out, but suddenly not having it there, or having other people affect the location of the dresser, we have to be very careful in working on that. That's why we can't just have it available as a furnishing item, or something that can be readily placed. The fashion report in the Gold Saucer has been quite popular. Are there any plans to expand on it, or any more rewards to it? 
I'm sure we'll continue to make updates to it, but there is one issue. The issue we have, say for example, is one particular week, the theme is summer vacation, and then the expected answer to give you maximum score is something that you can't believe is the answer to the theme. The sensibility of the person making the themes and assignments if their sensibility is horrible, it causes an issue. We tried to make adjustments to alleviate this, but unfortunately I can't check the minute content every week. With the update, we also need to find a developer that has better fashion sense, or have the current person polish their sense of fashion. While they do that though, we might have issues where their taste is really horrible, so it's pretty tough. It's great that we're able to add content like that though, where it's not very clear cut, and there are options where you can talk to players and get their input. We're we're able to allocate more resources to create content that is a different flavour compared to the more traditional ones we've had. We'd love to add more content like this in the future. And that wraps up the Gamer Escape interview that was released on the 17th of June 2018. Some of those points were really interesting to me personally. I didn't cut this down too much, I thought it was more worthwhile to read the entire thing. Obviously you want to go and read this yourself, then please follow the link, give these guys some support. They did an excellent job, some really well thought out questions from the community and also the publication itself. Some of the things that concern me more than others, the glamour dresser furnishing item not actually being possible for the time being is a little bit confusing to me. If it really is that much of a spaghetti of coding then I guess we're just going to have to learn to live with where the glamour dresses are and the new locations they add in the future. But for now that's the way it is. Either way, thank you very much for watching this video. I just simply read out someone else's hard work. Please go and support them in the link below and I'll see you all next time.